the great work that's going on you know, in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at North Carolina State. So it gives me a, an opportunity to be able to beat my chest about the great work that's done across the many different disciplines within the college. A um, couple of things I'll just mention, exciting things that are going on in the college. We recently received um, our third largest uh, award to the college. It was a, a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation award that was re recently awarded to Dr. Craig Yencher from the Department of Horticulture and his, and his team, not only here, but around the country and around the world. It's a $12.4 million grant to, to NC State to be able to support our sweet potato research to increase food security in sub-Saharan Africa. And I think the sweet potato story really is a great story. Within the last couple of decades, we've been able to grow sweet potatoes to be number one in the country uh, here in, in North Carolina by developing new varieties that are disease resistant and better quality. And then also working with the sweet potato industry to be able to grow sweet potatoes, uh, not just to a table crop, but also to a lot of value added products like the sweet potato french fry industry, which has significantly grown in, within the last decade. And we've also worked towards value added products such as aseptically processed sweet potatoes. The other thing I'll mention as well, which I think is appropriate to mention in this meeting, is our, our new and exciting plant sciences initiative that we have uh, in the state of North Carolina, North Carolina State being an important leader and partner in that effort. If you've not heard about the plant sciences initiative, it's, it's presented over in the innovation fair, but it's, it's our vision to be able to bring together the many different interdisciplines that we have not only within the college but around the state to be able to work towards solving complex issues in plant sciences. Things like water and water use and management, pest and disease management, uh, things like solving the issues around food security. We're trying to make a better world for plants that are used for human feed, for animal feed, and for bioenergy. The other exciting thing about the Plant Sciences Initiative is we're looking to engage government industry and academia to be able to leverage our ideas, our people, our resources so that we can connect for North Carolina our needs and opportunities for growth in a very, very important area. We're very fortunate in that in the state of North Carolina, we've got this tremendous set of assets that creates a really nice equation for plant sciences. Nowhere else in the country in the world do we have the equation of having a strong foundation of scientists already in the state an opportunity to be able to study different soil types and different climate types from around the state in partnership with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. And then we've got this great diversity in the plant products that we produce around the state in combination with an energetic and thriving bioscience surrounding Research Triangle Park. So uh, we're very excited about that initiative as well. So uh, these are just two examples of some of the great things that are going on in our college. We now present to you, I think, 12 different mini presentations about some of the other great work that's going on in the college. So with that, I will have each of the faculty members self-introduce themselves and the great work in which they are doing. Enjoy. I'm Chad Stahl. I'm in the Department of Animal Science here at North Carolina State University. My research focuses on examining how early life nutrition can impact the activity of tissue-specific stem cells that are responsible for lifetime fat, muscle, and bone growth. We care about this because if we can alter the activity of those stem cells, we can improve the sustainability of swine production, but also because the physiology of pigs is so similar to that of humans, this work also has direct correlation to diseases of importance for human health, such as uh, osteoporosis and obesity. We work with both mesenchymal stem cells and with satellite cells, which are the muscle-specific stem cells. And the behavior of these cells change as animals and people age. And these changes alter their ability to turn into the cells that they are fated to become. I'm hoping that we can identify the true nutrient requirements of neonates, so that if we really know how to provide nutrition to uh, infants to maximize the outcomes that we want to see with our tissue-specific stem cells. So my hope for swine production is that we're able to improve overall feed efficiency of these animals, hopefully by 25 or 30 percent. 
Uh, and for humans, I, I would love to be able to have modifications to infant formulas that could help reduce the incidence of uh, obesity, uh, insulin resistance, as well as osteoporosis later in life. The, the concept of how something that happens early in life can have a, a lifetime impact on both humans and other animals uh, was something I found just very exciting. And it's interesting because we're at an intersection of science where the same work that we're doing can help feed the world, but at the same time improve human health uh, additionally. And it's, to me, it's just a very exciting field and it provides a lot of opportunity for us to really make a, a significant contribution both to animal agriculture and human health. I'm Ron Heinecker with the Department of Crop Science at NC State University. Recently, I had somebody tell me that the difference between toiling and achieving is having a vision. And I want to tell you about our vision in crop science as well as what we're doing to achieve that vision. Now, you re realize I use the word R because in any good research, there's not just one person involved. You get collaborative research results when you work with animal science, uh, agriculture engineering, with others in crop science, and I, I want to recognize the collaborative efforts that go on to make this research possible. I'm going to talk about my vision in, in three icks, and that ick doesn't involve right now manure, but it could be manures could be part of those icks. The first ick I want to talk about here is robotics, and one of the things we're doing in the area of robotics is bringing uh, unmanned aerial vehicles into the crop uh, production system using the same techniques or thought process they use in the military applications, uh, basically turning swords into plowshares here. We're looking at identifying targets in the field, what is going on at, at those locations of the field, what are our, our uh, threat levels for that target, is it a pest, is it a disease, is it a nutrient problem, and then we're coming in and making the appropriate response. This year, for the first time, we'll be looking at these little helicopters dropping in and applying just the right uh, material in just the right spot there. You see there another example of robotics. I think the day is coming when those 500 horsepower tractors are going to be a thing of the past. We'll use little automated robots using p power cells or, or uh, solar power to get the job done. I look forward to working and as those things come to fruition at that time. The next ick that I want to talk about is genomics. And most of you have heard or talked about genomics over the past two days here. We understand or at least have analyzed these uh, fabulous codes of life that exist in all organisms across the, the planet here. But the, the challenge for us is to, uh, to actually read those sequences and read them in response to the environment that we have around us. And we are working in that area in our project there at Crop uh, Science. One of the things we're doing is looking at phylochron interval, the relationship between leaf development and temperature. How is phylochron interval uh, impacted by planting date? And it is impacted by planting date, whether because of photoperiodism or other uh, aspects of that. We're looking at how phylochron interval is impacted by plant density or stress. If we can get that plant to grow quicker, to develop leaves quicker, we can get more root development, utilize nutrients more efficiently, utilize water more efficiently, and get better yield. We're looking at corn, and, and you just heard Chad talk about embryonic stem cells. We have seen in, this pa in our research in the past two years where if a corn plant emerges just 12 hours later than its neighbor, it changes not just its yield potential, but its form and function to such a degree that it becomes a weed in that field, even though, and you could tell this within a week or two, even in the absence of true competition for light or nutrients, that plant is already smaller, the leaf uh, width is already smaller. Obviously, something is affected in that early growth, those early de cellular development, and we're working with that to try to understand that in, in cornfields. More than that, we're working with the Amplify Project to look at linking these genetic codes to those events that I just described, uh, trying to find the code that actually encodes for that uh, early growth, that early root development, and identify differences in, in hybrid and genetic materials. So that's an exciting part of what uh, I see for the vision for the future. And finally, the last vision that I want to present here is a word that you probably haven't come across, 
In fact, probably if you're a linguistic, you're probably saying, I hope I never see that again. I'm calling it precisionomics. And this is the very thing that was mentioned yesterday. We've got to be more precise. We've got to find a way to precisely apply nutrients at the right time, at the right place, at the right rate, even to the right plant. Hopefully, we'll use robotics to tend plants much like a gardener tends his, his rose bushes today applying plant by plant the right amounts of material sometime here in the distant future. One of the things that we're particularly interested in is these large data sets. These farmers today in yield monitors uh, with soil sampling devices are collecting reams and reams of data that are site specific across the field. How do they determine what to do in response to that information? We've developed some tools to look at site-specific variable rate seeding rates across the field using yield, soil data, soil parameters in that, uh, in that algorithm. We've looked at uh, site-specific use of nutrients using large data sets. That's going to be our challenge in the future. We want to have every plant has a function. Uh, ye maximizing yield, that function has to include the different amounts of nutrients, different amounts of light and water. These are the things that we're trying to achieve in order to, to reach the vision there that I presented here for the future. I'm excited to, you know, as many people ask me, why are you so excited about working in, in agriculture and crop science? I'm excited because we have a vision. And we're not just toiling, we're achieving. Thank you. My name is Linda Hanley Bowden. I'm a William Neal Reynolds professor in the Department of Molecular and Structural Biochemistry. About uh, 2007, I was at a meeting in um, Mozambique, and I met a person by the name of Joseph Nugrundrup. And Joseph is now my collaborator. He's a co-PI on an NSF bread grant with me. And I remember sitting on the floor at that meeting looking at some data he had. He was just really getting started as an independent scientist at that time. And we were looking at pictures of cassava plants that were devastated with disease. The reason why this is really important is cassava is the number two crop in Africa. It is a key source of calories um, for over 700 million people in Africa every day. Unfortunately, because cassava is not as important in the developed world, uh, there hasn't been nearly as much emphasis on the problems in cassava. And so when I was sitting in the floor with Joseph all those years ago looking at these pictures, you know, I was really wondering, you know, what could we do to make a difference? And you know, for a while there were no opportunities, but then NSF came, came out with this BREAD program, and the acronym stands for Basic Research enhancing agricultural development. And the goal of that program, which is in collaborations with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, is to look at fundamental questions that impact um, problems in agriculture in the developing world, with the idea being fundamental information that you can gain about what the sources of these problems are, maybe what the underlying mechanisms are can then be translated into solutions to the problems down the road. I've had a number of undergraduates who come and work in my lab, especially in the summer, so they'll come and work for a couple of months. And I give them options, and you know, I tell them what's going on in the lab. And we have three very different projects in this lab. And inevitably, they gravitate toward the cassava project. And I think they do that because um, it's very easy to relate what we're doing to a major problem in food security. And they like the idea of working on something that has a real world outcome potentially. I think if we could figure out how to reduce the disease pressure on cassava, the potential for growth of production is huge. The other thing I've really, it's gotten to be something I hadn't appreciated when I got started on this, but is I think as important is uh, transfer of technology and capacity building. The problem's an African problem. I'm interested in helping Africans solve it, but ultimately the solutions to any of these problems are going to have to be coming from African-led efforts. I have a student in my lab. Cyprian Rajubu, who is from Tanzania, he's doing his PhD research here. Cyprian, the goal is for Cyprian to return 
to Tanzania when he finishes his research and be part of the solution, be one of the leading scientists to take the next generation to lead these efforts. I'm Gary Robertson, Associate Professor and Extension Specialist, Biological and Agricultural Engineering, uh, College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, NC State University. I'm the Engineering Consultant for the North Carolina AgriBility Project. AgriBility is a partnership between North Carolina State, North Carolina A&T State University and East Carolina, and the AgriMedicine Institute, where we assist farmers that have suffered some form of disabling injury or disabling illness maintain a level of productivity. We design and, or help design and develop assistive technology or adaptive technology that we can apply to tractors, combines, you name it. We've got several demonstration units here today. Uh, we'll take a look at the garden scooter. That was one of our earlier projects. It's designed to allow someone to be able to move through a garden, harvest produce, vegetables, whatever they want to do, lets you get down close to the ground so you don't have to bend or stoop or crawl. The original design was developed by Dr. Mike Boyette here in the department. Uh, we've been making some modifications and improvements all along and we have student groups working on enhanced versions of it. We also have a uh, all-terrain wheelchair. There are some commercial units out there but this one was uh, it's a standard powered wheelchair that our students modified to make it all-terrain and they've been able to demonstrate it climbing hills, climbing steps, going through streams. So again, if someone needs to go out and maybe go around the fence line, checking uh, status of livestock, uh, or maybe just going hunting or fishing, uh, that's a, a device that will help them do that. We've got a truck lift. Um, there are commercial lifts available that you can put on the back of a truck that you can lift things like coolers or baskets of produce. Uh, into the truck and take to the farmer's market. This is one that's much, much less expensive and it's also something that a farmer, if he's got a good shop, can fabricate or could have fabricated locally. Uh, but again, it's designed to make that task of lifting heavy objects into the back of the truck a lot easier. We've looked at other technologies and in a lot of cases things that are available off the shelf just find a way to adapt them to that role of making things a little easier for farmers that have these disabling or uh, debilitating injuries or illnesses. The senior design aspect of our agribility project is very unique to us, I think. Uh, we're one of the few, perhaps maybe the only one, that uh, incorporates the senior design component into the agribility program. Some of the projects are things that we have gleaned from dealing with clients. Again, Michelle deals a lot one-on-one -on -one with clients, so she gets a lot of ideas. We will formulate that, write it up, present it to the senior class. Uh, we don't twist our arms. Uh, the seniors are free to choose the projects they're interested in. However, the last couple of years, some of the first ones chosen are the agribility projects because they see how practical it is and how useful it is for someone at the other end, the client, in other words. I think this work is important because we're trying to maintain productivity. Our farm population is steadily getting older and a lot of knowledge and experience is out there and a lot of these people aren't ready to quit. So this is all about maintaining productivity, giving them the tools that they need so they can maintain that level of productivity safely and comfortably. Good morning. So we've been hearing a lot over the last day and a half about all the grand challenges facing food production in the future. Uh, one of the major issues that hasn't come up much so far is diseases. And so I'd actually like to start off this morning uh, asking you guys a question and give you the opportunity to participate. So you can actually text, tweet, or use the URL on the slide here to uh, pick the option that you think best answers the question, how many bacteria should you actually be afraid of? So I only have five minutes, so uh, I don't have a lot of time to give you guys to actually respond, but I know you're all as addicted to technology as I am, so I'm sure the uh, phones and tablets are already within arm's reach. And <clears throat> as you go through and, and type in the codes, the results should start coming up on the screen. There we go. So uh, 
we'll give a few more minutes for folks to, to respond. So as, as the stuff's rolling in, you, the majority of responses look like they're showing up in the bottom couple of options, the 25%, less than 1%. And that's more or less what I would expect for this audience and where everybody works or lives or what they're thinking about every day. When you ask this same question to the general public, you tend to get answers in the 50-50, or in some cases, some folks even think all bacteria are bad. Um, that's mostly uh, probably a, a function of mostly in the general public. The only time you actually hear about bacteria, nobody ever gets good news about bacteria. It's usually you're in the clinic getting a Z-Pack, or you're watching the news, and it's about a food recall because of some foodborne disease or some issue. So, but the real question is, how many, or I guess, what is the right answer to this question? And I would agree with more or less the response here that it's probably in that 1% range. But in, in all honesty, science, we don't really have an accurate answer for this yet because we're still identifying, still discovering new bacteria. And the ones we already know, we don't really know a great detail about most of them. For example, there are 10 to 100 times more bacterial cells living in and on us and animals than there are actually cells in our body or in animals' bodies. And of those, only about 5 to 10% can we actually grow in the lab or, or work with or really, really do experiments to really truly understand what they do and how they do what they do. So if the vast majority of all these organisms aren't known or, or all we really know is just a little bit of sequence data from, from surveys, from molecular biology projects, what are the rest of them doing? So I'm Matt Cosey. I'm an immunologist in the prestige department of poultry science here at NC State. And for the last several years, my lab's been part of an interdisciplinary research team working with Dr. Hosni Hassan, who's a microbiologist in our program, as well as the research director of the Microbiome Corps at UNC Chapel Hill to try and develop novel control mechanisms to prevent specifically poultry, but animals in general, from being colonized by foodborne diseases like salmonella. So right now, our research is focusing on can we manipulate the gut bacteria to enhance the immune response of the animals themselves and to change the microenvironment that makes the gut less hospitable to these pathogens. So far, the results are yes, we can, but the really difficult question comes in is really trying to understand specifically how these shifts are affecting both the immune response and the microenvironment. There are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of different species of bacteria in the gut intestines, and so they shift in varying directions and, and in very various combinations depending on what stressors or what stimuli we use. So there's a really complex ecology at play and understanding what that ecology is is going to take years and if not really, honestly, probably careers before the royal we science is actually really truly able to understand the mechanisms of how all these uh, things interact with each other and with the animal themselves. So for this approach, this sort of novel idea of, of controlling diseases and, and animal growth, for this to really take hold, it's going to take the next generation of agricultural scientists and animal scientists to be steeped in these concepts and this information or these ideas get into it a whole lot sooner than most of us have. So to that end, uh, the NEFA-funded project that most of this current research has been working on allowed us to bring in nine Keenan Fellows, who the, uh, three elementary, three middle, and three high school teachers, who each spent a summer working in the three research labs in this project, learning the concepts, uh, learning about the research. They then work together to develop a vertically integrated curricula around the idea of I am an ecosystem. They then went and worked with 4-H to convert that classroom curriculum into 4-H activities and after-school program uh, content and learning experiences that's now being pilot tested in 10 counties across the state. So far, the reviews from students and participants have been off the charts great. The students are actually asking for more. Uh, with that rave review, we're, we're hoping to be able to start rolling this out across all 100 counties in the next couple of months. And if things continue to go the way they have been going, by the end of the year, it'll be submitted to National 4-H. So this food safety curricula can then be used nationwide for 4-H uh, programs and potentially even classrooms and beyond. So another piece of all this of project we've been working on as well is if ag biotech is going to continue to be part of the engine that helps drive the innovation that keeps us able to meet these challenges as they come, we need more and more people to participate in biotech. We've recently started a project working with the Bertie Early College High School in Windsor, North Carolina, where we're actually trying to create a mini biotech company in their school. 
So this past summer, we had nine students and two teachers come and spend a week at State uh, working in the labs at BTEC. We put them through a little one-week crash course on everything related to bacterial protein expression. And the students got to touch cloning, optimization of expression, purifying, and even scale up with the idea that hopefully in a, in a few months, they'll be able to actually start producing milligram amounts of recombinant protein that my lab and other labs at State can start using in our ag research. So after the, the one week short course, they're now back in their lab and we've been making monthly regularly scheduled visits to go and help them develop the process in their classroom and <clears throat> get, get closer to the goal of actually being able to become a little mini, mini company. The next phase of this, and hopefully be able to make contacts with, with many of you in the room, is next summer we're hoping to have the students back to state and we'll also work with them in the lab, but the main focus will be taking them out to meet with folks in the park and different companies so that you guys can start to talk to them about career options, CVs, interview skills, cover letters, career, uh, what types of courses they should take if they go to college, internships that might be available, or even if there's entry-level jobs if they don't otherwise uh, want to go straight on to school. So hopefully this will be growing the grassroots workforce to help drive the economic engine of biotech to help so meet the needs of future food as we move forward. Well, I'm, I'm Barry Goodwin and I'm uh, in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics in uh, CALS. And I also have an appointment in the Department of Economics in the College of Management here at NC State. I love analytics and that's really um, a big big part of what I do and it's really kind of what we specialize in in our, our department here at NC State. Crop insurance is kind of a, a unique and, and, and not just crop insurance but this bigger issue of modeling risk is is kind of a unique problem because we have data. Um, it's an immensely important public policy issue. Uh, it has some very important commercial and, and market uh, implications. So it it's just uh, really has all the components that make for an interesting research program from my perspective. I mean, it's taste and preferences, but it's important policy. We do get to work with policymakers. Uh, there, there's a, a lot of um, times, you know, you feel like your work may not be affecting policy directly, but I can tell you that this, this work does have a very important direct impact on, on the policy that, that actually makes it out into the farm sector. Big part of our work involves um, how the distribution of crop yields changes over time, how it's been affected by technological innovations. So we, we've had uh, biotech and, and some of the uh, genetically modified crops that have actually realized some very, very important advantages in terms of reduced risk. It's not just about a higher yield, but it's also making the crops more robust to drought or insect pressures and that sort of thing we analytically model those effects on crop yields. And the program's actually shifted in the last 10 years or so to really encompass price risk as well. And there's some very interesting statistical issues that, that come up because prices are very much related to yields. And if yields go down, prices go up. So there's a relationship there that um, drives the risk associated with farm profits. You know, it's just a astounding story what the, the natural scientists have accomplished and the commercial uh, entities that work in this area. And, you know, the, the, the technology is really sort of endogenous to the environment and to markets and that sort of thing. It is constantly moving, and that's one of the exciting things about looking, looking forward. Hello, my name is Dr. Penelope Perkins Vesey. I'm a professor with NC State University and also with the Department of Horticulture and the Plants for Human Health Institute down in Kannapolis at the NC Research Campus. My area of specialization is post-harvest physiology, which means I encompass everything from the time a fruit or vegetable leaves the farm until it gets to the consumer. But this is fresh, not processed. So I will take fruit and vegetables that need to get to a person in good shape in order for them to be able to eat them and figure out ways to make that happen, whether it's a matter of cold storage or trying to extend their shelf life. An additional part of my 
research now is to look at how bioactives change with storage. Can we increase bioactives by applying certain technologies after storage or during storage? Or can we try and maintain what comes out of the field? One of the things that we're working on in North Carolina is small fruits and the small fruits industry, particularly raspberries and blackberries. The blackberry industry in North Carolina has grown from zero acres about 10 years ago to over 400 acres now, which doesn't sound like a lot compared to wheat or corn or rice, but in terms of value, an acre of blackberries is worth about $50,000. So we're trying to do the same thing now with raspberries. Raspberries traditionally like cooler climates, but we have a breeding program here where we're looking at heat tolerance. And one of the things that's being developed are a number of selections that have the heat tolerance. And my problem is to try and make these last after they've been harvested so we can get them to market. We want to be able to hold these fruit going from less than a week, in most cases, to as long as four weeks so that we can get a bigger market share. We hope that we'd be able to establish a nuclear industry starting from North Carolina and spreading up the East Coast so that we can supply all of the East Coast with berries at least three to six months of the year. Good morning, my name is Harry Daniels. I'm the head of the Applied Ecology Department. I'm also an aquaculture specialist with the uh, Cooperative Extension Service. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit today about one aspect of what we do in Applied Ecology, which is the aquaculture <clears throat> program that we have there, which is more related to farming. Some of you may have heard of it as being fish farming. What I want to talk to you about is some of the challenges that we're facing in fish farming and some of the approaches that we're taking to, uh, to face those challenges. The main challenge that we're facing right now has to do with sex, fish sex in general. And the particular problem that we're looking at is called sexual dimorphism. That's a very complicated word, but if you look around this room, there's sexual dimorphism going on here. The men in general are about 20% larger than women in humans. In fish, that effect is amplified. We have fish that are 100% larger, one sex than the other, or 200% larger. Normally, that's not much of a problem, but the sex that's smaller in general never makes it to market size. So imagine the problem that it would, chart, that would, um, that would present if half of your crop could not be sold because it didn't make market size. So this is a problem, but it's also an opportunity for us, and this is where we're focusing a lot of our research. So the graph that I'm showing you up there shows actual real data of one of the sexes growing much larger and faster than the other sex. So two of the fish I'm going to describe here for you today are the tilapia, which you may have heard of before, very widely cultured fish around the world. So this is a problem that's a worldwide. Uh, tilapia are actually cultured in every continent except Antarctica. And then the flounder. So I'm going to show you some of the approaches that we're using. So for the tilapia, the approach that we're using to combat this problem of sexual dimorphism, one of the approaches is hybridization, where we're taking one species, crossing it with another, two semi-related species, and we're producing a hybrid that therefore produces, we're covering ourselves here, mostly males. So in the tilapia, the male is the faster growing of the species. And if you go to the grocery store today and you buy tilapia, those are all males that you're eating. They've all been converted into males through the use of hormones. That's not a secret. What we're trying to do is hybridize and produce mostly males without the use of hormones. That's one of the goals of what we're trying to do with tilapia. Here's another approach that we're using. This is essentially birth control for tilapia. We've produced and we're looking at an approach where we have a protein that blocks egg production for the females. Female tilapia will hold the eggs in their mouths and incubate them basically for weeks. The fry also will come and stay in the mouths. So you can imagine the females don't eat during that time. They don't eat, they don't grow. That's one reason why they're smaller. So what we're trying to do in this approach is try to block the egg production or block the formation of the eggs. If that happens, we think that the females will then grow possibly as fast as the males. So again, this is kind of a birth control method that we're looking at for the tilapia. Again, it's the worldwide problem, so it's something we think is very important. This is a difficult slide to look at, but in flounder, it's the exact opposite thing. It's the females that grow three times faster than the males. This is a huge problem with flounder. So we have to look at a much more complicated um, mechanism. Um, this is a very simplified slide, but feel free to come over to the Innovation Fair to talk to me about it, and I can give you some of the details. That is not an error on that slide. That little fish that's down there that kind of doesn't look like a flounder at all, that's one of the techniques that we use. We use the sperm from an unrelated fish in order to produce these gynogens. So 
This is a very complicated sort of a process, but it, it turns out that in the end, we can produce 100% female fingerlings. Here's another challenge that we have. It's not related to sexual dimorphism, but it's more related to environmental tolerance. So what we do is we produce a hybrid striped bass. One of the species tolerates salt water. The other species does not tolerate salt water. By hybridizing them, we actually produce a sterile hybrid and a fish that can be grown in all different kinds of culture areas. What does this allow us to do then? We can grow those fish in a variety of types of waters instead of just strictly one or the other. So it expands the opportunity for the production of that fish. In this particular case, it is a sterile hybrid and it is more disease resistant and it can be raised in all different sorts of, of, of uh, salinities. In order to do all this, we had to basically, um, we had to do the complete genome for both of, those, um, both of those fish in order to have this happen. So in summary then, I kinda, what I think would be a good take home message for you today is not all two fish are the same. I mean, there are very vastly different challenges that are associated with fishes. And sometimes we use the same approach on, on that fish. Sometimes we use different approaches on that same fish. But the opportunities are still there for all these fish, and especially with the case of sexual dimorphism. That's a huge opportunity for us. And if we can confront that challenge and improve that, then we'll have much better production efficiency in aquaculture. So thank you very much. So my name is Rodolfo Barangu. I'm an associate professor at NC State in the College of Agricultural Life Sciences within the Department of Food, Bioprocessing and Nutrition Sciences, and I run the CRISPR lab. So CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspace Short Palindrome Repeats, CRISPR, uh, together with associated sequences called CAS genes, CRISPR associated genes, constitute the CRISPR-CAS immune system. And this is an immune system in bacteria that is arguably equivalent to the adaptive immune system uh, in mammals and vertebrates, except it's DNA encoded RNA mediated sequence specific targeting. And what CRISPR is, is a fancy system that allows you to selectively cut uh, double stranded DNA selectively, specifically, efficiently, and affordably. And it has changed the world of genetic studies. Uh, and genome editing specifically with huge implications across three different types of industries. One is the biotechnology industry, obviously. Uh, another one is food and ag and the development of uh, strains and organisms of interest for the ag industry going all the way up uh, the uh, supply chain. And last but not least, translational medicine and the genesis of uh, disease uh, model systems for human applications. Uh, and also gene therapy to correct uh, flawed genes in human cells. It's really giving rise to a technology that's going to make a difference in the real world. And, and industrially, we've seen that happen already. And if you use yogurt, or if, you, if you consume yogurt, or if you consume cheese on, on a, on a daily basis or regular basis, it's happened already. You have used a CRISPR-enhanced product. You've consumed a CRISPR-enhanced product, and that's the role. Um, of a, a land-grant institution like NC State to really make a, a difference for the industry and consumers uh, on, on a very large, broad scale. Uh, but, but beyond this, for biotechnology and, and translational medicine, we've seen promise recently in the CRISPR literature with people being able to you know, excise you know, inserted HIV-1 viruses out of human cells or be able to rewrite and edit genome sequences that are implicated in liver cancer. Uh, or uh, DMD, um, to change muscular dystrophy, whereby you're able to go into a genome and really change the content of the genome to make it right and correct it. In, in closing, you know, clearly CRISPR is a very compelling topic. Now is the right time. NC State and our lab is the right place. We have the right team. And it's providing tremendous business opportunities and, and actual deliverables that are pertinent to, to, to different industries. And as we've seen from, from VCs and large, large companies, it is a very sound investment. And, and it has happened already. And now the question is, how far will people take the technology? And, and how creative people will be in their use of CRISPR? And only the future will tell how far they can go and how fast they'll get there. I'm Sui Jing Hu. I'm a soy ecologist in plant pathology department, College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Over the years, we have been working on microbial mediation of plant response. 
to elevate the CO2 in the atmosphere and climate warming. This is a collaborative research project between NC State and the USDA AIS rally unit. And the leading PRs are Dr. Kent Boki and Dr. Rich Zobel at the USDA AIS. Here we can see the project we manipulated the air temperature and air to, uh, CO2 concentration and then we look at how those changes in CO2 and the temperature in the atmosphere affect the, the plant microbial interaction in this case in soybean and how they feed back the soil microbial process and then how they affect the soil trace gas emission particularly CO2 and N2O natural oxide. So those are two important greenhouse gases. I grew up in the mountains areas and from very early stage I was fascinated in the, by the diversity of plants and I grew up on a fa farm so we were always struggling to grow enough food to meet the daily need. I feel it's my duty to help advance the knowledge base to generate the knowledge which could help for to enhance the food production and the security in the future. Good morning, Carolyn Dunn from the Department of Youth, Family and Community Sciences. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you our work in the area of overweight and obesity, specifically the Eat Smart, Move More, Way Less program. It's one example from the College of Ag Agriculture and Life Sciences of our work in addressing the human dimension of food and health. Dr. Ramaswani yesterday talked about wicked challenges. Few challenges are at quite as wicked as the obesity crisis. It is certainly a health concern, a social dilemma, an economic burden, a policy issue, and at its core, a personal challenge. Uh, we set out to create an intervention uh, that would scale to serve not hundreds or thousands, but ten or hundreds of thousands of participants. We knew that that intervention had to have impact, and we knew at the end of the day it had to be sustainable. We created the Eat Smart, Move More, Way Less program, which is a 15-week weight management program that's built on strategies proven in the literature to be associated with achieving and maintaining a healthy weight. Each lesson at its core informs and empowers participants as they live mindfully and work towards eating smart and moving more. It's based on research, hundreds of pieces of research in the literature that have shown what the strategies are that we know that are research and evidence-based to achieving and maintaining a healthy weight, and I'm sure you're all familiar with all of these on this slide. But what we did is, is ground those strategies in theory, and the theory that we use that underpins Eat Smart, Move More, Way Less is the theory of planned behavior. And so everything we do and how we work with our participants embeds this theory in helping them to lead to intention that we know is so critical and ultimately have them achieve that behavior that we're asking them to do. Now this is a, a pretty um, old theory. It's well grounded in science. It's been researched not only in weight management but in also in other areas of health promotion. But we also employ a relatively new theory and that's one of the small, small changes theory. And what this theory states is if we can get people to make these small incremental changes, not large sweeping changes, they're more likely to achieve those for a lifetime. So we employ not only the theory of planned behavior, but the small changes theory as well. Eat Smart, Move More, Way Less is a program that explores these behaviors with participants. We also identify strategies, which is part of the theory of planned behavior, so we're not just giving them information. And we help them learn how to live mindfully, which is a core component of Eat Smart, Move More, Way Less. And again, also a relatively new uh, practice in the area of health promotion. And we we encourage them to uh, maintain these behaviors for a lifetime of healthy weight. As important as what it is, is what is, is, is not. Eat Smart, Move More, Weigh Less is not a prescriptive weight loss diet. At no time during the program do we prescribe a calorie level or a specific diet. It's not a diet with special foods. It's uh, not a physical activity prescription. 
And although the program begins and ends in 15 weeks, it's not something that participants will ever finish as we encourage them to employ these strategies that we share with them for a lifetime. It also employs planning, tracking, and living mindfully. Mindfulness is a big component of the program as we encourage people to pay attention to the foods that they eat and pay attention to the, to the uh, exercise that they get. Now, living mindfully or mindfulness is certainly not a new strategy. It's grounded in the ancient religion of Buddhism, but it's very new in the area of health promotion. And so throughout the 15 weeks, we talk about mindfulness and being mindful and doing things on purpose, specifically mindful eating or eating with awareness. Um, unfortunately, we're faced with a lot of unhealthy foods in our culture, and how can we be a, more aware of what we're eating? And also mindful physical activity, being mindful of the activity that we get. We wanted to look at how we could deliver this um, and to have it be sustainable um, we looked at in-person delivery, which is a traditional way to deliver a health promotion program, but we knew that that was not scalable. So in our attempt to make this a scalable model, we looked at real-time online delivery. And this is synchronous distance education with a live instructor with a similar cohort or the same cohort going through the 15 weeks. So this real-time online delivery not only gives us a scalability immediately, but it also allows us to offer classes at untraditional times. Our most uh, popular class, believe it or not, is 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, it's not limited for, to groups that could gather 15 or 20 people in one place. We can re reach remote uh, areas of the state where we can gather people in an online environment to have that, um, that critical mass. We designed this using best practices of distance technology, which NC State is known for, and it's interactive with multiple opportunities for the participants to interact in this online environment. Um, and looking first at, at impact, so we have a proof of concept and we have the scalability issue, but, but can we have impact? Uh, looking first at in the in-person the in uh, model, we have um, a couple of studies that we did looking at can we have impact using the in-person. We have a weight loss average of eight pounds over the 15 weeks, which is incredible con uh, considering this is not a prescriptive weight loss, not a clinical weight loss um, program. Improved BMI, which is body mass index, seeing people move from unhealthy BMIs to healthy BMIs, and importantly, from the obese to the overweight category, which is where we really see um, changes in healthcare costs. Uh, improved blood pressure and an improved mindfulness, which was one of our strategies, was to improve mindfulness. So this was the in-person. So we were able to have impact in the in-person environment. But can we have impact in that new, novel, online, synchronous distance um, work? And so we compared the, uh, the in-person to the online, and we saw very similar outcomes regardless of delivery strategy. So this was very promising to us that we could deliver a weight management program, a health promotion program in the online environment and see similar outcomes. And you see here the outcomes of the, uh, the weight loss outcomes, just looking at that one indicator of weight loss in the online versus the in-person strategy. So conclusions that we drew from this is that the real-time online distance education is a promising approach to delivery of, in this case, a weight management program, but we think it has promise for delivering not only weight management or health promotion, but also disease management, which is so critical as we have so many citizens struggling with chronic illness. Um, and we also think the real-time online distance education supported by um, email, which we also used email, um, is a, a great way to expand a non-clinical weight management program. We looked at impact in another way as well in looking at return on investment. Uh, working with a health economist, we looked at the cost of delivery of Eat Smart Move More Way Less in the online environment and what the, health, what the health outcomes could be in cost savings. So for every dollar spent on Eat Smart Move More Way Less online, $2.75 could be saved in medical care cost and lost productivity. So we have the impact in a couple of ways, the impact in actually the measures that we looked at in mindfulness, weight, and blood pressure, but also in the, in the return on investment. So now we move our, our look to sustainability. So how do we sustain this? We have great reach in the online environment. We have a product that we've developed that has impact. So we believe that sustainability of health promotion products such as is Eat Smart Move More Way Less are really moving them to the healthcare side of the coin. And that is having healthcare pay for this like you would an x-ray or a visit to your doctor. And so in doing that, we're working with the state health plan and they're asking us to deliver this product to their insurers, which we're doing. 
and saving them money on health care and working with Blue Cross to have this covered as, you, as it would be for any other health care expense uh, that you might have. Thank you for this opportunity. David Tarpey, I'm a professor of entomology and the extension apiculturist or the honeybee specialist for cooperative extension. Honeybees are really indispensable members of the commercial production agricultural industry and that's because they provide an invaluable service of pollination that then enables seed and then fruit set. So if it weren't for honeybees and other pollinators we wouldn't have about a third of everything that we eat and that third accounts for all the fun stuff, all the fruits and vegetables and nuts. And so the things that really define the Western healthy diet is really honeybees are responsible for that. And so they're really important for sustainable agriculture going into the future. One of the more basic projects that we have going on right now is to look at the genomics of queen development and their reproductive potential. Because there's only one queen per colony, Anything we can do to improve the genetics of that queen will go a long way to improving the health and productivity of the colony. And so one of the limitations of doing research on queens is that there is only one queen per colony, so you often need lots of colonies in order to conduct the, this type of research. So a way to uh, fast track that type of project is to raise queens in vitro. So we're actually raising test tube queens um, in the incubator where we can do many, many queens and, and actually look at a lot of the underlying genetics that are responsible for what makes a good queen good. Well, honeybees are just cool. I mean, there's just no other way around it, right? Um, honeybees are a wonderful model. So not only are they important to the sustainability and to the future of agriculture, but they are a model social insect. They are a model system to investigate how groups of individuals function together as a cohesive whole. And so that extra layer of biological complexity of the colony is really fascinating to me and it offers a lot of insights into how nature works. And honeybees are cool. So now you know the reason that this Midwestern man came to, to Raleigh, North Carolina. It's the great work at which the faculty and staff in the College of Agriculture and Life Science do every day. And I hope this provides you a breath of all the work in which we do and the great diversity in work in which we do to be able to try to provide solutions to the future of food. You know, you learn from the smallest molecular network of DNA and RNA to microorganisms into the gut, to honeybees, to soybeans, to pigs, to fish, extending ourselves to the human dimension. These are areas in which we work every day to be able to, be able to try to provide solutions. We work on, non, we work on traditional agriculture, non-traditional agriculture, and the intersections that it makes with life sciences and biosciences. We're trying to solve problems locally here in our region, in our state, nationally and globally. Let's please give a hand for all of the researchers that provided feedback today. <laughs>